Where's Ron? I got you. Eyes up. Hey. Eyes up. Hey. Is that the mummy? Berlin, 1885. German Chancellor Bismarck, the most powerful man of his time, invites to his palace 16 diplomats from the leading Western countries to sit together around a table. Their aim to divide up between themselves a continent, Africa. And they will succeed. It can be traced back to the late 1800s during what was called by the Imperial European powers the scramble for Africa. Colonization was motivated by the European hunger for African resources. In January 1914, Britain unilaterally created the modern state of Nigeria by uniting two British protectorates in West Africa, one in the Muslim north of Nigeria, one in the mainly Christian south. Using the BBC archive, Alex Last looks back at a defining moment in Nigerian history. Many people like myself, who belong to an earlier generation of Nigerians, cannot help feeling somewhat overwhelmed by the prodigious changes which our country has undergone in just a little over half a century. The voice of Ernest Ecoli, the late Nigerian nationalist and journalist, who was born in 1893. We should not forget that the Nigeria we see on the map today as one country was not always so. It was not a country, but a mere geographical expression. When Ernest Ecoli was a child, Nigeria was being shaped by British imperial ambition. It had already led to the creation of a colony at Lagos and a British protectorate declared over much of what is now southern Nigeria. Then, in 1900, a veteran of Britain's colonial wars, Sir Frederick Lugard, was sent to Nigeria to extend British control northwards to the Muslim emirates which made up the vast Sokotor Caliphate, one of the largest pre-colonial African empires. In 1943, just a few years before his death, Lord Lugard himself was recorded in a rare interview with the BBC. Mr Joseph Chamberlain, when colonial secretary decided that the British government should cancel the Niger Company's charter and assume direct control. I was appointed to this task as governor of northern Nigeria on January the 1st, 1900. The basic issue was that Britain did not want France to get hold of this territory. It wanted to make sure it had it for itself. John Smith is a former Nigerian colonial officer and writer. Lugard, who was a soldier, essentially, and a child of empire, he was born in India, after all, he was given the mission to actually try and subdue the North and make them subject to Britain as a protectorate. I found that the greater part of the country was under Muslim rulers who annually raided the pagan tribes for slaves with armies of horsemen set to number several thousand. I sent a letter to Sultan the Sokoto, courteously worded, but insisting that this slave trade raiding must cease. He replied curtly that between us there was only war. I had at my disposal a small native force, which I had been instructed to raise in order to check French aggression, for at that time our relations with the French were very strained. The Muslims were defeated and the raiding was stopped. A protectorate was declared over what is now northern Nigeria, but even under British colonial rule, north and south remained separate entities. With little infrastructure or transport, the two were worlds apart, as Ernest Ecoli remembered. There were no railways, no roads, no motor cars, and of course no aeroplanes. To go from Lagos to Kano was like going to the end of the world. Perhaps many of you have heard of the story of the prosperous Lagos merchant who, in 1903, imported a motor car, but had to ship it back to England because there were no roads on which to run. In the Northern Protectorate, there was also a huge difference in administration. When Lugard had defeated the Northern Emirates, he had a problem. He had very few men to impose British control, and Britain was not going to supply more. By this stage, London wanted empire on the cheap. So Lugard adopted an idea from British India and promoted the policy of indirect rule. 
using the existing traditional leaders to govern under British control. The structured political world of northern Nigeria's old emirates seemed to fit the bill. He had a population of 7 million in an area of nearly 300,000 square miles. And the total British military and civil establishment in 1908 was 399. The only practical way you could run the country was through the existing institutions. It worked very well initially in the far north, and Lugard was excited about it, and it became the cream. But there was opposition too, not least in the southeast, where the British created chiefs where there had been none, so they could extend their policy of indirect rule through local leaders. But despite the unification, British colonial officials continued to rule the constituent parts as virtual separate territories. They barely even spoke to each other, as one colonial officer's wife recalled when she described her voyage on the ship out to Nigeria. Officials going to northern Nigeria and those going to southern Nigeria looked upon each other with equal contempt, I think. We never spoke to each other. But the internal separation had serious consequences. The South remained exposed to Christianity and took to Western education, while the North remained independently Islamic. 100 years on from unification, the fault lines still remain. The scramble for Africa gave rise to European invasion after the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. This gave birth to colonization and the eventual creation or amalgamation of Nigeria by Britain in 1914. Before colonization, the current people of Southeast, most part of South-South, Igala in Kogi, and Otubo in Benue State, Nigeria, were identified as one Biafran nation, occupying the same territory till today. Also, during Nigeria First Republic, the eastern region reflected the cultural and indigenous grouping of the present southeast and south south as one people. Divide and rule, break them into smaller parts and make them weak. Scatter them and they will never come together for their freedom. This is the greatest conspiracy against the people of the southeast, south south and other Biafran people in Nigeria. In 1986, General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida, IBB, Nigerian Muslim Head of State, registered Nigeria as a member of Organization of Islamic Country, now known as Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC despite having half of Nigerian population or more as Christians. To prove that Nigeria is an Islamic country, on 15th of December 2015, Saudi Arabia enlisted Buhari-led Nigerian federal government among 34 Islamic countries that have formed military alliance to fight terrorism. We are Biafrans, mostly Christians. We want to be free from Islamic Nigeria. In case you have forgotten the words of Sir Amadou Bello, the Saudana of Sokoto and the Premier of the Northern Region, let me remind you, he said, and I quote, the new nation called Nigeria should be the estate of our great-grandfather, Usman Danfodio. We must ruthlessly prevent a change of power. We shall use the minority of the North as willing tools and the South as conquered territory and never allow them to rule over us, nor have control of their future. These we are the words of Amadou Bello during his independence speech, as reported in Parrot newspaper, October 12, 1960. Amadou Bello never concealed his hatred for Eastern Nigerians, now called Southeast and the South South, whom Amadou Bello referred to as the Igbos.
Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headmen of that camp. As clearly stated by Amadou Bello, they use the minority of the North, called Middle Belt, to prosecute the genocide war led by Gowon against Biafra in alliance with the Yoruba West. They have held the South as their political and economic slave entity, exploiting every single resource from Southeast and South South, while they ruthlessly prevented the change of power after the death of Umaru Musa Yaradua, which brought in good luck Jonathan and a German from South South as Nigerian president. And to complete their mission, Boko Haram is brought in to force Nigerians under Islamic rule. I want to just pick up on one point that you made there, uh, you know, the insecurity uh, in the country, Boko Haram. How are you going to tackle that beast, if you want? Are you going to offer peaceful negotiations or are you just going to hit them hard? Well, <laughs> hit, him, hit them hard with what? <laughs> Twenty-one people have been killed after an explosion that rocked the Emma Plaza in Abuja this evening. Briefing journalists at the scene of the blast, the police spokesman Frank Mba explained that 17 people were injured in the incident, while 17 vehicles were completely burnt as rescue operations continue. It was gathered that one of the two persons suspected to be behind the explosion also died in the blast, while the second person has been arrested by the police. The explosion is coming over a month after two explosions rocked the nation's capital, killing scores of people. The Abuja blast follows another one in the Mubi area of Adamawa State this afternoon. Reports say the explosion targeted a police patrol team in the area, though there were no casualties.
Just like the disaster that befell the buffaloes, the people of the old eastern region, currently southeast and south south, we are scattered, divided, disintegrated, and battered during and after the Nigerian genocide war against Biafran people. Fellow Bia friends, on May the 30th, 1967, Biafra has come to stay and the fact of our independence is irreversible. I send to you all fraternal greetings. The greatest victims of that genocide war were mostly women and children, just like the young buffalo that was caught by the lions. This is a people's war for freedom. Younger generations are usually the biggest losers and victims of such occurrences. The Islamic Caliphate of the Northern Nigeria is the lion that is attacking the Southeast and the South South. Just like the buffaloes we are attacked, the Afro people of the old Eastern region we are scattered as a people. And they erected a huge wall of division among us. The Northern Nigeria plundered our land, exploited our resources, while Fulani headsmen are at loose in our villages destroying our farmland, raping and killing women and children. When you look at the facts that something around one million people perished as a result of the actions of the British and Russian and Nigerian federal governments, um, I don't know what one does call it, but... Uh, it was the first of the genocidal wars that a great power got as close to as Britain got uh, to the war in Biafra. And that was totally wrong. And that was wrong. Over one million Biafrans, all British Commonwealth citizens, died in the Nigeria-Biafra Civil War. Today, more than 30 years later, questions remain. Was it genocide? Was it backed by the British government, willingly or unwillingly? If you have part of the population, well, as I say, the whole population being wiped out and, and murdered without any protection, on these grounds, ethnic or religious or economic grounds and so on, you have genocide. Nigeria, the richest and most populous nation in Africa. 360,000 square miles, the same size as Britain, France and Germany. 65 million people, three major tribes, houses in the north, Yorubas in the west, Igbos, Biafrans in the east. Some say the British rigged the odds against the Igbos from the beginning, from even before independence. Of course, we also knew that the elections by 1960 had been rigged. Everybody in the know knew that we had our boys in the north, our puppets, we'd put them in power. They hadn't won at all. The people in the south had won. The nationalists. Some say war was inevitable. The rest of Nigeria had always been jealous of the unity, the strength of the Igbos, the way they had managed to march together to build a better future for themselves and their children. Tuesday, May 30, 1967, 
Enough was enough. The Igbos alone, isolated, ignored, declared their independence. The war that followed was one of the longest, bloodiest and most disastrously fought civil wars in history. In just three years, they used more small arms ammunition than was used by British forces during the whole of the Second World War. The casualties were horrifying. The war was also unlike any other civil war in modern history. The Nigerian government, backed by the British, regularly and deliberately strafed and bombed civilian targets. Um, I saw ten deliberate bombing attacks on the civil, civilian population, either hospitals or marketplaces, and with no question of any military target being in the vicinity. At precisely half past one every day, they come over the town as the marketplace is full, as patients are sitting out on the lawns at hospitals. I looked up and I heard the explosion. The convent was still there, but then towards the school, there was a cloud of smoke rising off to the sky. The children's ward was the worst. Children's ward got a uh, rocket right through the roof. There was a mother and child killed in bed, and another child was killed in another ward, and another child was cut in half up behind the kitchen. Why it was deliberate, they finished an operation, and next three hours they come back again. So you could see that kind of thing for three days or four days. Even more horrifying, the Nigerian government deliberately used famine as a weapon of war. The name Harold Wilson became a curse. Starvation was known as the Harold Wilson syndrome. Many people, young and old, rich and poor, went to Biafra to help the starving and the dying. One of the youngest, the most famous, the most glamorous was Princess Cecile de Bourbon Palmer, sister to one of the pretenders to the Spanish throne. She told a committee of the US Senate what she saw. On the committee was Senator Edward Kennedy. I, I told him how I have been going out of the Biafra and uh, that uh, one of the last night, I was with the children, and the plane was not coming, and we were very anxious. And I have in my, I have, I had in my arms a little girl of, I don't know, ten years old, and she was very anxious herself to see if the plane would come and save her. And finally, we hear the motor's engine. The plane is coming. She looked at me, she smiled, and she died. Widespread rioting broke out across Nigeria during the summer of 1993 when a promise of a return to civilian rule was broken by the dictator Babang Gita. He announced a crackdown on all pro-democracy activists, including the Ogonis. Ogoni was surrounded, villages were blocked in by military checkpoints and attacked. Over 800 people were slaughtered. Ogoni land has yielded about 40 billion dollars in oil revenue. This spill has been going on for the last uh, six weeks. This sort of pollution, to live with it in an area where land is in very high demand, is completely destructive of the community. 
Ebro kure ba de pori ro ne bubra no e de ranja kun kana ne wi ro kun kana e leme gwa chara ti o mole o dogo kana o de kana on the 31st of October, the Ogoni Nine were found guilty and sentenced to death. Despite worldwide appeals for clemency, on November the 10th, 1995, Ken Sarawiwa and the eight other Ogonis were taken to Port Harcourt Prison and hanged by the neck. <laughs> Everybody run, run, run yeah. Everybody scatter, scatter yeah. Some people lost some bread yeah. Someone nearly died yeah. Someone just died yeah. Police, they come, honey, they come yeah. Confusion everywhere yeah. Please, even as Baramatu or uh, your chorus I will I'm from Baramatu now uh -huh. So tell us your name Wait, Please speak louder Wilfred Oyai Oyai, how old are you sir? I am um, 38 years 38 years So what happened? What happened? Why are you here? I took me job. How did you come about coming here? Well, uh, my village got burned. Your village got burned? Uh, my village has a name, uh, my village is Okumu. Okumu? Uh, That's your village? Uh, it's from Okunugunuma. Okunuma village. Okunuma village. Okunuma village. Okay. I don't know where my, my, mom, my, mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, this, my mom, my mom, my mom, my mom, I don't know where, I don't know, I don't get food, not, not I get my peace and everything. Okay, which village you did before you come up with your hair, so? Oporoza. Now you did. Now the town, the North Carolina finished. No, no, no. Where's your husband? My husband. I never see my husband myself. My husband is there the raw. I never see her. See my baby when I carry her into the sea in face. All in face, all scatter finish. I don't know where my husband is. 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 I don't know where the middle 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 is. Strange is in fiction, mind boggling and horrifying. The words barely describe the sight that greeted residents of Amancia in Oka, North Local Government's area of Anambra State, as 30 dead bodies floated in Izu River in the community. The river is at the boundary between Enugu and Anambra states, and the dead bodies were found at the old Enugu Onisha road axis of the river. A corpse that could easily, not easily be identified, was suspected to have been dumped in the river Friday night by unknown persons. Natives of Amancia say that some of the bodies they saw had been swept away, while some were still buried down and would float later. Anambra and Inugu State Commissioners of Police who visited the area say investigations have begun to unravel the mysterious occurrence. Actually, our attention uh, was drawn to that and uh, we dispatched our men. And right now, as you can see, we are at the scene and uh, we have seen some corpses uh, flowing in the river and I've contacted my colleague, uh, that is the Commissioner of Police in the state, since we shared the boundary and uh, we are going to form a high level uh, investigative team which is going to investigate the incident. Actually, as of now, we don't know the exact number, but I've seen about uh, 10 to 15 courses. We don't know the exact number, but the uh, investigation will be there. In Inugu State, there's no clash between any community, which I believe the same apply to a number of states. All right? So in the course of investigation, investigation will determine from, or rather the sources of these corpses. As I'm talking to you now, I'm here with these detectives from Inugu, which I believe the same will apply to a number of states. They will team off to find out the cause of these corpses. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't 10 northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians, a temporary or permanent one? 
In actual fact, what it is, is a northerner first. If you can't get a northerner, then we take an expatriate like yourself on contract. If we can't, then we can employ another Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can foresee, because it will be rather dangerous to see the number of boys we are now turning from our, all our learning institutions coming out with having no, no work to do. I'm sure whichever government of the day might be, it will uh, feel rather embarrassed and it might even lead to bloodshed. Doesn't this damage the idea, sir, of uh, all people in all regions in, in Nigeria being fellow citizens of one country? Well, it might, but uh, um, you are, I mean, new to our region, but how many northerners are employed in the east or in the west? The answer is no. And if there are, there may be ten laborers employed only in the two regions. I beg of us to please respect this fellow character. Chairman House of Representatives Committee on Federal Character Idris Ahmed soliciting more respect to federal character principle as he declared the workshop open. It is in furtherance of the noble ideas that no part, section or interest in the country will be given any reason to feel sidelined in the public service positions and distribution of social economic All principal officers of the House must represent the principle of equity and uh, federal character. And uh, to that end, we've also ceded the position of the House uh, uh, leader to, uh, <coughs> to the Fermi groups. And uh, finally, uh, in an event that uh, they do not accept uh, this position, then uh, we should all honorably uh, go and do what is right by holding elections to uh, elect the various uh, individuals that will uh, represent, uh, uh, that will occupy the office of the principal uh, uh, officers. In line with the uh, principle of equity of federal character that I have stated, while conceding the uh, office of the uh, House leader to the Fermi uh, group, we actually added that whoever is being nominated must not come from... So people are not prepared to look at merit because they are talking of federalism and representation. It is not necessary at that level. Every child that we've seen from these children that spoke with us this morning has the potentiality. All what we have to do is to prepare the infrastructure to encourage the best in every child, and there will be no need for discrimination. So would you suggest we do away with that uh, federal character and all of those specifications in our laws? I'll say yes. I'll say, because I've, I've been with students. I spoke, I've, I've, I've been with students in the University of Lagos from all over the country. I now have knowledge, working knowledge of students from southeastern part of the country, and I'm telling you, we're talking of a boy state, which is one of the greatest disadvantaged states. The kids are brilliant. Given the kids the opportunity, they will stand on their own with any kid anywhere in the world. So I'm, I'm just for merit, honestly. If today we just said merit is it on anything we do in this country, this country will be China. The Buffaloes were moving together as one great nation, marching towards a greener pasture. Freedom. Unknown to the Buffaloes, they are lying in wait. Lions predators that lay ambush ahead of them, ready to devour them. Suddenly the lions unleash a very fierce attack against the buffaloes. A young buffalo became a victim of the attack. Left behind at the mercy of the lions. who tear out their own pound of flesh from the young buffalo. Crocodile 
another predator join in spoiling the prey. This happened because the buffaloes were scattered, divided, and disintegrated. While this was happening, the buffaloes went back and regrouped, binding themselves in unity. to confront the challenges that threaten their existence. The enemies that spoiled them and devoured them. They came together standing shoulders to shoulder to engage their common enemies. They bruised, battered, and scattered their enemies. As the predators ran for their lives, the buffaloes came together. The buffaloes rallied together. And they were able to rescue their young from the lion. This is the power of unity. We can overcome only if we are united. South East, South South, all dear from people, let us unite as one. Northernization policy. That means a Northerner first, as introduced by Amadou Bello. It is still in practice till today. It is now called Federal Character. Eastern region, now Southeast and South South. We are and still the greatest victims of the conscious and calculated conspiracy which they have used all these years to deprive our younger generation education good job opportunities good medical services proper social integration and prospects for the future this non policy of amadu bello is still invoked in Nigeria today. It is now called federal character by Nigerian government. The implication and meaning of federal character is to ensure that the children of the North has priority in gaining admission into the university over the children of the Southeast and the South South in job recruitment into armed forces, civil services, and federal appointments. The North takes 51.3% of it, while their Yoruba partners take 21.6%, leaving the entire people of the Southeast and the South-South with just 13.5% respectively. Take a look at the National Assembly, Ministerial Appointment, Armed Forces, Record of Admissions into the Institutions of Higher Learning. You will agree with me that the people of the Southeast and South-South are nothing.
for slaves in Nigeria. We, the people of the Southeast and the South South, allowed ourselves to be divided during and after the genocide war against the Afra. We do not have a common political and economic ideology. We allowed ourselves to be dictated upon by the scripts of Northern political ideologies and the one Nigerian scam. This is a call for unity of the present people of Southeast and the South South. Igala in Kogi State, Otuku in Benue State, and as well a banquet in Edo State, to all come together and stand shoulders to shoulder to confront our collective adversity that have threatened our existence as a people. The entity that has vowed to change our way of life and put us into perpetual slavery. It is time to unite as one and speak with one voice. There is nobody called a Nigerian. If you go to Lagos and there's somebody in the bus and they ask, how many people are in the bus? They say five persons and one Gambari. Who is a Gambari? Is he not supposed to be a Nigerian? If you go there, ah, you go to the north, they say Nyamiri. You go there, say, ah, Berebe Banzani. If they are rioting in Kano, they will not look for Ghanaians to kill. They will look for Igbos, Yorubas, and Ijaws to kill. The same is everywhere. So where is the Nigeria we are talking about? Until the issues of the Niger Delta and the people who are dispossessed of their sovereignty is solved, there will be no peace. And people like us will not agree. Because the Bible says, and I want to quote, How can I sing the Lord God's song in a strange land? How can I, an German, be called a Nigerian and be made to sing a Nigerian national anthem when I am not a Nigerian? I will live, I live and die a German. I will never, never, never become a Nigerian or a River State man. I am not. This battle stand called River State, why was it created? To cause confusion. When the Igbos rose against the Nigerian oppressive state, in order to cause confusion between we and our brothers, the Igbos, Ojuku uh, Gowan deceitfully created what he called River State, another Batustan, another homeland for dispossessed people. Please go on. Yes. The problem of the Niger Delta started when Britain fraudulently incorporated our people after we signed treaty of several treaty of protection, protection with them into this evil enterprise called Nigeria. And we have been resisting that we are not Nigeria. From the time of King Coco Boy, Okia of Membe, when they defeated the, Brit the British at Akasa, which the British shamelessly described at the Akasa raid. And King Judge of Opopo, King Ibanujiko of Okrika, uh, and uh, as Boro, who in 1966 declared the Niger Delta People's Republic, who still stands today. Nigeria is an occupation force. Nigeria is a colonial government op uh, occupying the territory of the Jaws, the Queres, the Eches, the Shekris, the Orobos, as Zionists are occupying Palestine as India is occupying Kashmir, as Sudan is occupying Darfur. We have the right. It is our right, inalienable right, to fight for our self-determination and sovereignty which was stolen from us by the British. In 1914, 
Nigeria was created by one sick man called Lolugad. The moment we are um, Biafrans by indigenous identity, even though we are Nigerians by citizenship, which was first. Indigenous people of Biafra is a group of Biafra, remnants of people of Biafra whose God helped to have their lives spared after a gruesome civil war, Nigerian Biafra War of 67 to 70. They are found in, in Nigeria and some part of other countries outside Nigeria. But they are concentrated mainly in the southeast geopolitical zone, in the south-south geopolitical zone, and north central geopolitical zone. They are under a government, customary government, and they are under the Supreme Council of Elders of Indigenous People of Biafra. It's a well-constituted government that is recognized by the Nigerian constitution as a customary government. Just like you have Sharia uh, recognized as a system. And uh, nobody bothers you when you say you are practicing Sharia method or customary government. We have customary courts, we have customary laws, we have customary government. And that is the government of the elders the Supreme Council of Elders of Indigenous People of Biafra. They have an organ which includes so many departments. Information which you belong to for dispersal of information without accusing anybody or insulting anybody or provoking anybody or preaching ethnic etc. Then we have the uh, intelligence department, the political or diplomatic department, financial department, social department, department for youth, department for women and that. We have all these and it's well structured. We have it, an organogram, a chain of command. It does not, the government does not depend on the whims and caprices of one person. We are indigenous people of the Africa. In the southeastern part of Nigeria, leadership is ascribed to the old aged people. These are the leaders of the people. So you're talking about the Supreme Council of Elders? Exactly, that's what I'm saying. The traditional legal system, which is the right of the indigenes to make laws within their own community. These laws is what governs the indigenous people of Biafra. The name Biafra is the name our forefathers have always used to define the territorial area within the eastern region they occupy. They were the people known as Biafrans. They were the people the Portuguese met within the 13th, 14th, 15th century when they were mapping all the Atlantic coasts and came within the territorial waters of uh, what they then call the Southern Sudan. And when they came in, they found a people and a territory that are self-governing, known as Biafrans. Hence, they call their territorial waters uh, by of Biafra. United Nations, oh. I'm happy to report back that uh, Bilier Human Rights Initiative have been recognized by United Nations oh. and have been given the full ECOSOC um, membership. Uh -huh. Um Iho Min Biafrans is that Bilie can now start advocating for self-determination for the Biafran people. 
in partnership with the um, United Nations. We need to remind ourselves of the principles that led to the founding of the United Nations. Among those are feasible coexistence and self-determination of peoples. In this context, Mr. President, the unresolved question of self-determination for the Palestinian people and, of those, and, and those of Western Sahara, both nations having been adjudged by the United Nations as qualifying for this inalienable right must now be assured and fulfilled without any further delay or obstacle. The international community has come to gain its hopes on resolving Palestinian issues through the two-state solution, which recognizes the legitimate right of each state to exist in peace and security. The world has no more excuses or reasons to delay the implementation of the long list of Security Council resolutions on this question. Neither do we have the moral right to deny any people their freedom or condemn them indefinitely to occupation and blockade. We need to remind ourselves of the principles that led to the founding of the United Nations. Among those are peaceful coexistence and self-determination of people. We, the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, have started independence campaign to help Biafra people in Nigeria to achieve self-determination. As administered by the Supreme Council of Elders, the customary government of the indigenous people of Biafra, His Royal Majesty, Honorable Chief Justice Ezozo, retired, is the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra. Dr. Dozier Ike Dife, Ikenga Neu, is the Deputy Chairman, while Brigadier General Joe Akizie is the Secretary, and as well, other principal officers of this customary government. Our ideology and adopted roadmap for pursuing self-determination and achieving independence for the Afro people hinge on rule of law by applying diplomacy, civil and human rights movement, court process, mass media, political and every other legitimate process of pursuing independence for the Afro. We abhor any form of breakdown of law and order incisive hate speeches or broadcast. We do not promote war as a way to achieve independence for Biafra. Through our legal and human rights department, the Lee Human Rights Initiative, Biafra sued Nigeria to court for self-determination in suit number FHC slash OW slash CS slash 192 slash 2013 at Federal High Court of Wearing. This established that Biafra is a legal entity and Biafra people have right to agitate for self-determination. This suit is still ongoing in Nigeria as the suit is now due to be taken to International Court of Justice. This is based on United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People for Self-Determination as well adopted by African Union and by extension Nigerian Constitution under the customary law. Through our campaign, Biafra has been accorded full consultative status by United Nations and African Union Economic, Social and Cultural Council, ECOSOC Department, and the delegation has been sent to represent indigenous people of Biafra at the United Nations ECOSOC meeting in New York, and as well, African Union ECOSOC General Assembly meeting in Nairobi, Kenya. Other diplomatic channels are being explored through countries that are still sympathetic with our noble cause. We need your diplomatic, political, moral, and financial support to achieve our independence. Contact Indigenous People of Biafra government on 080-3710-4017 or 080-372-59304. Please add plus 234 
if you are calling from outside Nigeria. You can also contact the Media and Information Department on plus 234-820-420-7522 or you call plus 44-744-821-7605. In Biafra, Africa shall rise again with the rising sun. Please support the Indigenous People of Biafra campaign for self-determination. We urgently need funds to do the following. To upgrade Voice of Biafra BVI Channel 1 from internet TV and radio broadcast to world-class satellite TV and radio station. Fund is needed to finance our suit for self-determination currently at Federal High Court of Wary, as we are set to take the suit to International Court of Justice through our legal and human rights department. Billion Human Rights Initiative. Fund is also needed to cover travel expense for our diplomatic missions to United Nations, African Union, European Union, and as well individual countries that are still sympathetic with our cause, while scouting for countries that will support this noble cause. Also, fund is needed to continue our women and youth empowerment program and as well community services. All these are capital intensive. 50 million naira is urgently needed to proceed. Our ideology hinge on applying the following. Diplomacy, mass media, court process, both local and international, political means, and every other legitimate means of pursuing our rights for self-determination in Nigeria and among international communities. We say no to war in Biafran land, Africa, and the world at large. We Seven one zero four zero one seven or zero eight zero three six two four seven eight one two. Please add plus two three four if you are outside Nigeria. Yes, we can. Yes, we can be free. In Biafra, Africa shall rise again with the rising sun. Voice of Biafra, BBI Channel One, giving Biafra a voice. When yeah. When yeah. When I got you. 